So welcome everyone here physically at Common Ground and all of my friends on the uh, in the Zoom room. Welcome everyone. Um, the poet Michael Kleber Diggs, a friend of mine, sometimes uses the expression sweet siblings. And that's sort of the way I think of us here tonight as, um, as kind of siblings in, in the Dharma. Is there anyone um, in the room who is here for the first time, first time at a Wednesday evening program? And your name is? Sam. Sam. Welcome to you, Sam and Paul. Paul. Sam and Paul, anyone else welcome? Ah, please. Veronica. Veronica. Well, thank you so much for coming. And anyone on the Zoom room who is new here tonight, you can raise your virtual hand. Susan. Great to see you and anyone else. Well, even if this is the only time you ever come to Common Ground, I want you to feel that you are totally a part of our community tonight. Very, very welcome to, to be here. So glad to have new people and familiar faces. Um, my name is Patrice Kelch and I am a longtime community member here. Um, I've had, a, it seems like, numerous lifetimes in this lifetime from being a, a philosophy professor to running a little arts organization to doing freelance writing to providing hands-on care for people in the end stages of HIV. And then my um, longest um, involvement was actually in uh, being sort of a services specialist for people with HIV. And, um, and then I spent a little time at United Theological um, as a kind of program coordinator for a Buddhist chaplaincy program. So, and I've also want to say that a big part of my practice, what has really influenced my practice has been for more than two decades, I've been a religious resource volunteer um, with the Minnesota Department of Corrections offering um, mindfulness to people who are incarcerated and have just found that to be a really um, kind of spiritually transformative experience in that there's a lot of a lot of wisdom, um, a lot of goodness um, behind bars. So that has really um, really influenced my practice. And before we go any further tonight, I'd like to offer um, a land acknowledgement. And common ground is cited on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. And I mean, actually, this spot was very close to some of the holiest, most sacred spots in, um, in Dakota uh, cosmology. And it is um, where we are is was actually extremely special to the Dakota people. So this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance to its original inhabitants and their descendants who live here today and to their future generations. We acknowledge the sovereignty of Native nations and our obligation to live up to treaty agreements. It is our intention to rectify the harms that we have committed and those that we continue to commit. This land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities. It is our hope that our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand with us in solidarity with native nations and to amplify the voices of indigenous peoples leading grassroots change movements. So we will begin tonight with um, about a 30 minute sit. I'll do a little gentle guiding in the beginning, then uh, a couple of minutes to stretch and maybe say hello to the person next to you. And um, then um, I want to offer some remarks on uh, something I've been thinking about a lot 
for the past two months, which is something called moral injury. And um, then I hope we can have some um, discussion too. So let's begin. Um, please make yourself as comfortable as you can. Um, find a posture that is um, supportive. And really, really just appreciate both online and in this room, the support that we give to and get from each other when we come and sit together. And I'd like us to begin our meditation this evening by appreciating the goodness of our intention and just the fact that we were able to get here this evening. You know, so often we have really good intentions and life sort of just gets in the way. So really appreciating that all of us could be here this evening. And as we begin, I'd like you to invite every part of yourself into the room, the virtual room or the physical room, that there's no need to compartmentalize, no need to leave out those aspects of ourselves that we're not so fond of, but really inviting our whole selves to be here completely present. And I'd like us to just enter into the body Our guiding teacher, Mark, sometimes used to say, you know, greet your body as if you are greeting an old, well-known friend. So come into the body. <laughs> Connecting with this body, this mind, just as it is right now. Feeling the support of the torso. Feeling the breath. Feeling ourselves just sitting upright in our lives right now. And I would encourage all of us to, as best we can, let go of any idea of what a good meditation is, what a good meditator does, that so often there is a kind of striving in our practice. that isn't, isn't always wholesome and healthy. So wanting to get it right, wanting it to be calm, peaceful, concentrated, And often that becomes an obstacle to really being present. It's said that 
relaxation is the proximate cause of concentration. Or instead of concentration, we might use the word collectedness, a kind of collectedness of mind and body. When we're not really striving. So we see if we can just inhabit this body and mind with kindness. With attention, very gentle attention. We're just sitting here being aware of the present moment's experience, coming and going. The experience in the body, sensations of the breath. We might be aware of thoughts in the mind, maybe even a lot of thoughts, racing thoughts, watching the thoughts come and go. What we're trying to do is to be present to the present moment's experience, however it is. Just bringing our awareness to the present moment's experience. And if it's helpful to you to rest your attention with the breath as a support, trust yourself and do that. If you can practice with an open awareness, allowing the whole, whole body, whole mind just to be aware and open, that's fine. We're practicing letting the present moment's experience be enough.
And for the last few minutes of our silent practice, I would encourage you to just see if there's anything in the present moment's experience that you can appreciate or have relate to with a sense of gratitude. And it might be something as simple as you showed up tonight. But just see if there's anything in the present moment's experience in the body, in the mind, that you can appreciate or relate to with a sense of gratitude. So please take a moment to stretch, stand up if you need to. Um, greet someone near you. Maybe you could give them a little weather report about that meditation session. Cloudy, sunny, overcast. I Okay. Well, we often find in in Buddhist practice uh, a kind of skepticism about concepts. You know, we often hear just be with the experience. But I found in some instances, concepts really allow me to understand and articulate my experience, mm -hmm. even to my, I mean, to myself. And one such concept is moral injury. Um, this is something I've been thinking about for the past couple of months, especially. 
it's a concept that was formulated after the Vietnam War to explain the situation of many veterans. And this is the definition of moral injury. Moral injury is the damage done to one's conscience or moral compass when that person perpetrates, witnesses, or fails to prevent acts that transgress one's own moral beliefs, values, or ethical codes of conduct. I'll read it again. Moral injury is the damage done to one's own conscience or moral compass when that person perpetrates, witnesses, or fails to prevent acts that transgress one's own moral beliefs, values, or ethical codes of conduct. So it's not only um, sort of actively doing uh, something that is in violation of your own moral concept. Sometimes it's, it's witnessing something that's, that's so damaging. Um, or uh, sometimes it's failing to prevent um, and um, this was most acute after the Vietnam War. Um, people found that they were unable to protect their, their comrades. Um, in some cases, um, people found it really hard to um, reconcile the killing of civilians, and especially women and children. Um, and this concept has been expanded a lot. So in, in healthcare, for example, um, in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, you know, when things were so frightening um, that there were, um, you know, some um, healthcare workers had to weigh whether or not they would continue to provide care to patients or whether they would not practice because they had family members who were extremely vulnerable, immunocompromised. I mean, this is just a terrible you know, moral, moral dilemma. Um, sometimes uh, in the, uh, that first most awful year of COVID, um, when people, um, the staff at a hospital, they were unable to let a family be with a dying person, which was just, again, transgressed all the sorts of care that they wanted to offer. Um, uh, and even uh, in sort of contemporary circumstances, when uh, a, a caregiver, a health care provider, can't provide uh, the treatment that is necessary for a person um, because of financial reasons or because of inst um, insurance um, issues, or you know, it's uh, in veterinary health care, for example, one of the great um, in areas where there, we find people uh, suffering from this sort of um, moral injury is when a veterinarian is asked to euthanize a pet, either because the owner doesn't want to pay for the care and the treatment, in particularly if it's something really serious, or in other cases that the, the uh, pet owners just don't have, have the financial resources to care for it. So the, the veterinarian is asked to put down an animal who otherwise could be brought back to, to health. Um, so in 2020, for those of us living here in Minneapolis, um, the police murder of George Floyd uh, resulted in severe moral injury to the actual people who witnessed that murder, the young women, the people who were there standing on the sides, begging, begging the officers to, uh, Officer Chauvin to get off George Floyd's neck. Severe moral injury. They're unable to prevent something that transgressed um, their, their moral beliefs, their values, um, their ethical codes of conduct. And for the hundreds and thousands of us, who witnessed that tape, there was often also a kind of, of moral injury. I'm just feeling that uh, as taxpayers, 
we um, supported a system that went amok in such a terrible way. Um, the feeling that we, uh, this was so, so much against our moral code. We witnessed something that was against our, um, our moral code. And the common responses to moral injury are things like guilt, shame, disgust, isolation or alienation, um, feelings of um, unworthiness, untrustworthiness, and the inability to trust others in, in these really severe cases of, um, of moral injury. Um, and what I want to suggest tonight, I mean, I find this such a, a potent concept, um, but what I want to suggest tonight is that many of us suffer from what I would call chronic low-level moral injury, um, that we end up participating in um, racist systems, that we end up benefiting uh, some of us from white supremacy. Um, for example, the land and, and labor theft um, that occurred in the past and actually continues into the present. Um, our participation in climate degradation um, and in the exploitation of animals. Um, you know, that, that there's often, and it's, it's not to say that we endorse these sorts of things, but we find ourselves in systems where we're often um, implicated, where we find ourselves complicit with situations and with uh, systems that actually um, go against our, our moral compass. And um, I think this is a particular kind of suffering when we are out of alignment with our values. And again, I think in, in many cases, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can, um, whether we are, um, you know, sort of paying an honor tax, for example, to uh, the Dakota for the land that we're inhabiting, whether we're working with anti-racist groups, whether we are trying really hard to, um, use resources wisely to, you know, recycle, renew. Um, what, but we find ourselves that we know that we're in these systems where we're, we're kind of out of alignment. And I was thinking about this, that it's kind of like having a chronic low-level inflammatory response. You know, that sometimes we have the sorts of, of injuries where there's just a kind of chronic inflammation and it's it's manageable it's low level it's not the biggest thing in our lives but it really impacts the quality of, of our our lives you know makes us cranky a lot of times which i think is is sort of one response to uh kind of chronic moral injury is a kind of crankiness um you know that that <laughs> um in, in the meta practice that I do regularly, um, there's a phrase I use, may, may I be free from all inner and outer harm. And you know, this is a kind of, of harm, our, um, our, in, our complicity with systems that we don't like, that we would want to change, that we know are, are harmful in many ways, even though sometimes while we're benefiting from it, you know, that we, um, you know, we can continue to fly on, on airplanes and we know that airplanes are, are a real pollutant. You know, it's not, it's not a huge big deal, but I know a lot of people who get on an airplane and maybe pay a carbon tax and, um, but just don't feel great about air travel. And there's a lot of stuff in that, well, this is a, you know, it's useful to take this trip. And you're, you're always kind of balancing off the, the benefits and the harms, but recognizing that there are harms in a lot of the things that we do. And it's not that we can, you know, 
no one of us gets out of here not doing not doing harm. The inevitable harms we bring to one another, we bring to the, the planet. Um, but the response, I think, to this kind of chronic um, inflammatory kind of low level moral injury is either to deny it, like really try to ignore it and deny it and just say, I can't do anything anyway. This is how it is. I can't make things different. I'm just stuck in this system. This is how it is. I'm not, I'm not responsible. I'm not you know, it's just, or deny actually, which is even more interesting, deny that there's any sort of uh, chronic inflammatory moral injury, you know, like, I'm okay, things are okay, you know, that sort of tamping down that kind of denial where we're tamping down our, our discomfort all the time. Um, you know, another way is just to acclimate and normalize and to say, this is the way it is, you know, always been this, you know, people have always exploited each other. There are these inequities, you know, that there's a way of just normalizing it um, and um, letting it go, you know, refusing to feel the pain, refusing to feel the discomfort. Um, it's interesting that Thich Nhat Hanh, the late great Vietnamese teacher, uh, in response to the climate crisis, said something very much like, and this is a paraphrase because I didn't, I didn't go back and, and uh, look at the documentary that he said this, but he said something very close to the most important thing to do with respect to the climate crisis is to feel the pain of the world. That's the most important thing to do. So one of the things that I'm going to suggest about um, you know, sort of our recognizing our kind of, of chronic um, moral injury um, is to, you know, how do, how do we work with this? How do we work with um, witnessing, being unable to prevent, even if we're not perpetrating? And lots of times we are witnessing or we feel that we are able to prevent these kinds of, of harms. Um, and I think, and sometimes people say, well, moral injury is just moral distress is another kind of word for it. But I think it, it's, it's more than just distress. I really do think of it as a kind of um, injury to one's conscience, to one's values. Um, and I think th the first thing is to recognize it, to really see those arenas in which we, we find ourselves feeling implicated in the sorts of systems that we, are, that we participate in. And just to name it and understand our, uh, our complicity, just to understand how a system works and how we're in it. And, um, and when we do that, I think the other thing to, to remember, and this is what I think is most important about us as a species, is that we are an incredibly caring species. I mean, that's the most important, I believe, the most important thing about us as human beings is that we are a caring species. And you know, there are other caring species, especially other primates, but we're a species that can care not only about our own kind, uh, our own families, people who look like us, we can care about um, other, um, other species. We can care about all kinds of animals. We can care about future species, um, you know, future beings that we have this incredible capacity to care. And none of us would be here if there weren't other human beings who cared enough about us when we were infants and toddlers to keep us alive. You know, we're only here because of care. And that's the most important thing about us as a, as a species, I think. And I think that's something to really remember when we're looking at this sort of chronic moral injury is to remember, yeah, we feel this because we are a caring species. This is why it hurts. 
this is why it is this constant gnawing kind of thing, because we really, really care. And that's really a, a wonderful thing to care so, so deeply that we can, um, we can admit the discomfort of our participation in these, um, in these systems. And one of the responses to this, I would suggest, is to get really good at practicing self-compassion. And self-compassion is this, you know, attuning to our own, our own pain and being able to, to do something about it. And in self-compassion, and this is something that is, is taught here, um, Jean Haley and Jane Rauenhaus teach uh, self-compassion. And if people are just interested in looking it up or listening to it on, online, the person who really developed this is uh, Kristen Neff. And you can find lots of um, podcasts and information about um, self-compassion. But the first step in uh, practicing self-compassion is to recognize the depth of our own suffering, not to minimize it, not to compare, not to say, you know, well, but my life actually is pretty good. So you, know, you don't minimize, you really pay attention to the depth of your own suffering, why this is painful, why this hurts, how much it hurts. Um, and then the next step is to realize that there are many other people suffering in exactly the same way. And what's so brilliant about that, I think, is not that it minimizes our own suffering, but we know that our suffering is really legible to other people who are also having this same kind of suffering. You know, it, it's why um, meeting in support groups is so helpful because you go and you meet with other people who recognize your pain, who know what your pain is, and they really can understand you. They can understand this kind of, of pain. So in doing self-compassion, we recognize that there are others so we don't feel so alone. You know, one of the, the responses to moral injury is to isolate, to feel alienated, to feel uh, you know, separate, to feel that there are people who can't be trusted. So in doing self-compassion, where we recognize that other people feel the way we do, that they have the same heartache, that you know, they're doing the best they can, but um, they're, uh, you know, the climate is is degrading so um, so rapidly, um, you know. So realizing that you are not alone, and then the third step in uh, self compassion practice is to bring mindfulness and loving kindness into your life. To really pay attention to the present moment, really be aware of your own moment-to-moment -moment experience, not to gloss over, not to deny, to really be present and to be present with a kind of um, warmth and tenderness toward yourself and toward all other beings. Now, one of the, the challenges sometimes in, uh, in learning to do loving kindness is um, and loving kindness in one tradition you know, starts out yourself. It's supposed to go from persons who are easy to persons who are, um, you know, pretty easy to do it yourself. Easy, easy to to the difficult. But sometimes people really find that it is um, really challenging to offer genuine kindness, concern for. I, I and sometimes I think of, of loving kindness as like a wholesome concern for one's own welfare in the deepest sense of, of welfare. So 
in doing loving kindness practice, what we're often doing is try to, trying to maximize the conditions under which we can feel genuine tenderness toward ourselves. Because that's what we would like to have, a genuine tenderness toward ourselves. And when we do that, and we can kind of hold that and hold the, uh, the discomfort, the inflammatory response to, to moral injury, I mean, that's kind of the challenge to hold both of that. Um, this week, um, I was listening to a Dharma talk by Sylvia Borstein. And for those of you who don't know her, she is um, sort of the California Vipassana, truly Jewish grandmother. She is, is um, someone who just brings such authenticity and wisdom and complete pragmatism to um, her, her practice. She's a very deep practice and she was a, a psychotherapist. Um, and one of my, the things I, I love best about Sylvia, whom I don't know personally, is um, besides uh, she is a, a, a meta happy birthday that goes to the happy birthday song. Um, but um, someone, a, a student from Stanford asked her in an interview, you know, so you, you do all this meditation and you, you know, um, you know, try to cultivate your mind. So what do you want your mind to be like? And Sylvia said, I want my mind to be like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And, you know, like everybody's welcome. Everybody gets listened to, you know, King Friday gets to be King Friday. Uh, Daniel Tiger gets to be kind of scared. Daniel, Daniel, Tiger. everybody's welcome. I thought that's so brilliant. Like what, you know, a mind like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And Sylvia um, gave a Dharma talk in the, the past weeks. If you go on Dharma Seed, you can find it. And it was really in response to what's going on in Israel and, and Gaza. And she said, you know, as, a, um, as an American Jew, this is, this is just, uh, it, she said, it is just, there's just so much heartbreak, so much suffering everywhere. And she said, there is nothing left to do but be kind to yourself and everyone else you meet. And she thought this was not a trivial response, this sort of impartial kindness. What you can do in response to this tremendous suffering is to really commit to being kind to yourself and everyone else you meet. And I've been thinking about this for the past couple of days because I listened to the talk maybe three or four days ago. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm a pretty kind person. You know, this is, this is good advice, but I'm a pretty kind person. And then I realized today that I was thinking about um, two kind of spiritual podcasters. And in my own mind, I was just being so snarky about them. Just so judgmental, so snarky, so... I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking, but it was, it was really snarky. And it just occurred to me, like, why aren't you kinder to those persons? I mean, like, as if they knew me, right? This is just sort of my own little, uh, you know, sort of mental drama. I just thought they're doing the best they can. They mean well, they're doing the best they can. They're helpful to lots of people. Be kind about it. Don't just be so so snarky and critical and, and, you know, in your own mind, uh, you know, give them a really, a really snarky review. So, and, you know, I mean, just, but it was something that I thought, oh, I'm such a kind person. And I thought, well, not really, you know, here's this, this kind of stuff that goes on. And couldn't I decide? Couldn't I, I manage to hold that kind of view or, uh, a friend of mine that I was talking with about um, uh, a Dharma friend talking about what was going on in the Middle East said, you know, people are just so enraged and so hurt that they're not able to take a larger perspective. 
that there are times when people are just so overwhelmed by something that you can't say, well, those are children. She said, no, all you can do is to kind of hold their, their rage and their anger and understand that right now they're not capable of anything else so that your job is to be more capable. Your job is to hold a bigger container. And I thought that that was such a, a, a wise and compassionate, you know, and, and you know, if you've had experiences yourself of rage or being around rage, people are just so over the top, so angry that you, know, you can't reason with someone who is over the top angry. You know, you can try to deflect them maybe, but you can't reason with them. And that you said, no, that, that um, our job around people like that may be just to take a bigger perspective, say right now they're not capable of anything else. Whether that's, you know, um, you might not think that's um, correct, but it, it, to me, it was really interesting to say, oh yeah, they're, this is this is rage and right now like that fire is is burning so practicing radical kindness and and compassion it's kind of that no one thing is i believe no act is too small you know people say well there's nothing i can do about it and i think well, is there something something little you could do um no act is too small um and another thing we can do to practice this sort of radical kindness, compassion, is to stay present. And I uh, read an article by two retired bioethicists a few, uh, well, a year ago. It's called Six Maxims for um, an Unsustainable, it wasn't unsustainable world, but it was a radically, radically altered, essentially unsustainable world. And one of the things I said that bioethicists learn is that even in the most awful situation, in a situation where there is going to be no good outcome, an outcome, none of the outcomes are the outcomes that anyone desires, they said, there is almost always something that can be done to make it less awful. And that includes staying present, not abandoning people. And they talked about sort of in, in uh, as, as medical doctors sometimes when, you know, like terrible decisions are made in um, the neonate ward and there are no good outcomes at all and stuff that no one, um, no one wants. And he said, no, you can make it, they said, you can make it less awful by staying present with people, by not abandoning them. And I think this is something to really take to, um, to heart, not abandoning people, bearing witness, um, being willing to hold the difficult and the complex, um, seeing both the micro and the macro, being willing to be vulnerable. I mean, these are all things that, that we can do that actually are practices of radical kindness and compassion. Um, and I think we can also cultivate friends who are willing to explore chronic moral injury with us, friends that we can really talk with about this in a very um, deep way um, so that we can all do what we can to act more in alignment with our values, even if we can't extricate ourselves from the system. Um, and I would also, I think it's really helpful to nourish our aspirations. You know, when we do the metta practice, we have this ultimate aspiration to be completely free from ill will. And ill will is essentially wanting to harm another for the sake of harming. So we have this aspiration to be free from ill will. And I think we should all just cherish our capacity to care. 
and as best we can to feed that capacity, to let it grow and grow and grow. Now, we may not be able to cure chronic moral uh, injury. We may all continue to live in systems that are in some ways an affront to some of our, our deepest values. But we can work with it skillfully um, and that we suffer less when we do that. And when we suffer less, we suffer less for the benefit of all beings. And that's really our, our aspiration. So that's what I have to offer um, this evening. And I would truly welcome any um, responses, questions, observations, your own um, experience with moral injury or that you've heard of. And um, you can either, um, I've got a mic here, if you want to say it from the room um, and um, I can repeat it, or if you're willing to come up here, I can give you the Zoom mic. Or um, if you um, are in the Zoom room, you can just unmute yourself and speak. And I think everyone will be able to, to hear you. So, and it's always <laughs> an act of generosity to, to share. So I encourage you. Is it Sam? Yeah. Um, can I give you a mic? Or would you give a come? I mean, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Just so that they can hear online. Um, can you hear online? Would you do a thumbs up if you can hear online? Okay. Um, well, thanks for naming something that I've experienced uh, and articulating it so well. Uh, I think that. For me, I've suffered the isolation from moral injury and, and haven't been able to articulate it um, for a long time. And, you know, I've been working on awareness and compassion and for myself. And I think that what I've been doing um, without being able to articulate it as well, you know, earlier now that I hear this, um, it occurred to me that I what I've been doing is scanning my situations in the moment and certain things that I can have the, you know, I do have the capacity, the bandwidth to, to address in the moment. Um, I do take action. Um, they might be small things, um, you know, like signing a petition, which I did earlier today, you know, I was feeling pretty, um, helpless in some certain, you know, circumstances, but daily, I, you know, in, in a couple, several times a day, I try to scan um, my, myself and the situations in, in the present moment and find uh, ways that I can take action and what I'm capable, what I have the capacity to do in the moment to, you know, alleviate that suffering. Um, and it changes daily, you know, my capacity. Sometimes the only thing I can do is rest or not, or take non-action. Um, and that is beneficial um, as well. Um, and someone that, like myself, who I'm, I've in the past been really highly reactionary, you know, taking the moment and taking non-action was the, what I was capable of doing. So, um, Doing that scanning and taking you know the time to be self-aware uh, has allowed me to find some peace and and uh, diminish some of that injury. So thank you. No, oh, thank you, Sam. Um, it, it is this. Um, I, I mean, that's mindfulness essentially. Checking in, being mindful, seeing what's going on, um, and sometimes um, restraint. Uh, sometimes rest, uh, really it's paying attention to what's really skillful in the, in the moment and doing what you can. You know, as I said, no act is too small. Other, other ideas or responses? Anyone online want to say anything?
Anyone in the room? Eric. Um, thank you so much for tonight, uh, very much appreciated. There was so much you said that, that really struck at my heart and my heart's, I've been feeling very, very vulnerable for quite a long time, uh, in the last several months. And I think it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, as you practice, you become, and your heart becomes softer, you feel it more and you're more aware of the suffering that was always there, but not that you weren't aware of. Um, and so um, what I found you know, in, in the current heaviness of the world is being less reactive, being more compassionate, being more realistic, being more kind to people. As you say, people who are feeling so much in so many different ways and just saying, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're expressing your feelings. Um, but it is, it is, uh, a difficult and newer thing for me to be as present as I am to that suffering within myself and within others. Um, but I, I, this, this whole thing of kind of low level, moral injury is is something I really want to explore in in my practice. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Would you please? Um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what you said, Patrice, but there was something about like attending to and, and being um, intimate with our own suffering and... Can everyone online hear or not? You can't, okay, okay. great. And um, yeah, I just wanna echo how I feel like for years and years, I did not believe that I deserved to feel my pain. I felt that I was too, like that my positions of privilege meant that, you know, I, there was, there's, there's more pain out there than what I was feeling. And therefore I should not feel like I should not take the time or the space or attend to these things. And um, that didn't make me more capable of showing up. It just made me less capable of being with and um yeah being with the suffering of others and really like deeply less capable <laughs> like it it actually made it actually makes empathy impossible at least for me in my experience um and and yeah and like it and like fosters from like fostered for me this this sense of um yeah, just a, a real inability to um, to witness others or be with others um, in their pain. So I just want to share that experience and that what you said resonated with me in that. Can you name again? Anders. Yeah, Anders. Anders. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. That that's really a, a wonderful. Um, insight that when we're unable to acknowledge our own pain, when we discount it, when we minimize it, um, we are much less able to be genuinely responsive to others. Thank you.
Anything else? Patrice? Mm -hmm. This is Rosalie. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rosalie. Um, I, I also really loved your comments and it's, it is a super useful framework. So I'm really appreciative of you offering it. I was thinking uh, of the companion. It reminded me a lot of Ton Glenn practice where you work really deliberately with pain and um, it helps you to, I don't know what it helps you to do, but it seems very related to this as, as a way to work deliberately with this step one of paying attention to the depth of your own suffering. With that practice, you know, you just take in the pain or the negative or the hurt and you breathe it back out. And uh, it's just been, could be a really good companion to the self-compassion, I think. I was just wondering if you had ever noticed that. And thank you. Uh, I didn't make that connection, but certainly um, the Tonlin practice is um, of uh, being able to breathe in and accept um, suffering and then breathing it out. And often Tonglen is um, suggested that people do it when they're pretty steady and pretty balanced, that sometimes taking on suffering, if you're not um, resourced in a way, taking on the suffering of others, if you're not resourced, is can be really challenging. But there is this, um, that what you're pointing to, um, I think is, is sort of developing this capacity, this capacity to be with suffering. You know, that really is like the, the first noble truth is there, we only encounter suffering in life. And so developing the capacity to be with suffering, I think almost paradoxically really develops the capacity to be with joy. So, um, so uh, I'll end tonight with a, um, uh, a little prayer that um, my friend Larry Yang, uh, Larry Yang is the, um, one of the, the founders of, co-founders of um, East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland. And he wrote a wonderful book called Awakening Together. And it's about um, community and spirituality. So from, and this is his meta prayer from awakening together. He says, may I be as loving in this moment as possible. If I cannot be loving in this moment, may I be kind. If I cannot be kind, may I be non-judgmental. If I cannot be non-judgmental, may I not cause harm. And if I cannot not cause harm, may I cause the least amount of harm possible. And I think this is a very um, pragmatic aspiration that, uh, that sort of recognizes the struggles some of us have. So Sylvia can you know, say, you know, always be kind. Sometimes it's really a challenge. Sometimes what we are just kind of going down and down. what is possible? And sometimes what is possible is, may I cause the least amount of harm possible? And that that's a worthy aspiration. So I'll share the merit and then I think we've got some, some announcements. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would share any blessings with our teachers, our parents, our families, our friends, our community. We would share any goodness with the people we like and the people we don't like so much. We would share any blessings with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people that we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, 
the winged, the scaly, the slimy, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all for your sincere participation um, this evening. And I think Robin's going, Robin, Eric, maybe going to make some announcements. Thanks, Patrice, for that really rich talk and grateful for the challenging of assumptions. Um, yeah, so a few announcements. Patrice is leading a workshop, not this Saturday, but the following Saturday on the seven noble qualities of a friend. And um, then starting December 4th, there is what starts, what's called our community practice intensive, which runs for three weeks ending with a day long retreat. So if you're interested in deepening your practice and community and kind of committing for those three weeks, it's a really, just from my experience, a really great way to, um, yeah, like dig in and, and then really you set your own goals for what what is your your playground, your edge in your practice. And the registration is up on the calendar page and will be um, in the weekly email. And then we also have our 31st annual uh, year-end retreat starting December 26th that runs through um, the 31st. There are three different ways to participate either here at the city center and you go home to sleep or at our retreat center in Wisconsin or on Zoom. Yeah. And if you would like to offer any Donna, any, um, any donation for Patrice, our center completely is completely run on generosity. And you can give in cash or check in the bowl in the lobby or um, on the square reader in the lobby or online. If you give online, please, write Patrice's name into the teacher fun box so that we know, you know, we know it was for Patrice's program. So Patrice will get two thirds and the center will get one third. And Zoom folks, I'll put that link into the chat. Um, yeah, and actually I have one more thing. I need a ride home. <laughs> so if, oh, thanks. Thanks, Anders, appreciate that. Okay, have a good night.